Hi all! This episode of Physical Attraction is brought to you by the American National Standards Institute. Standards make the world go round, and they also dictate what is round. Without standardised measurements and definitions, physicists would be speaking to each other in different languages and would struggle to understand the universe even more than we already do. You can learn about standards in America at the ANSI blog at blog.ansi.org slash pod to learn about how standards apply to you. Now on with the show. Look into his eyes. They're the eyes of a man. Of- Hello and welcome to Physical Attraction. So in this episode, I'm fortunate enough to interview Cornelius Schilt, perhaps better known to the world by his blog title, Corpus Newtonicum, which you can go and read at corpusnewtonicum.wordpress.com. He is a DPhil student at the University of Oxford, studying the history of science, and focused on the life, career, and works of Isaac Newton. What's more, he just handed in his thesis the day before I conducted this interview. Best of luck with the viva, CJ. In this, the first part of our interview, We discuss Newton's less well-known works, his attempts to understand the chronology of the ancient world, and how it tied into his religious faith, which predominated in his life. I hope you'll enjoy. Okay, so CJ, you are my guest today. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Very nice to be here. So first off, let's talk about you. Uh, You just yesterday handed in your thesis on Isaac Newton, Um, and I wanted to ask about how you first became interested in Isaac Newton and how you decided that you wanted to study the history that surrounds him. I was, I was trained as a physicist back in the days at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, and and like, like any other scientist, I'd heard about Newton. I'd, I'd studied his, his, his mathematics, his calculus, his, his theory of gravity, purely from, from a scientific perspective, how, how it can be used and how it relates to Einstein's uh, theories of special and general relativity, um, but I always had a had a, had a sort of an, an, an avid interest in the in the history behind the science. So um, I took several modules in, in history of, of science and philosophy of science during my undergraduate course, and then I I, I, I was basically offered the the option to do a two year research master on on uh, in history and philosophy of science. And one course that was that was taught was was simply called uh, Newton in context, and it sounded very intriguing and. Uh, we, we, we sat down in a seminar room with, with seven or eight students, and in front of us lay uh, a little sheet, a sheet of paper with a poem. And it, 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 was, it was about mythology. It, it, it talked about Jupiter and Zeus and Venus and the various things that the gods do to and with each other, as we all know. Um, and, and, and what was a riveting read? I, I had no understanding of mythology or poetry or for that matter. Uh, but I was I was surprised when I was told that this was Newton copying out of an alchemical treatise, and that this, this was not a love poem or whatever mythology. This was actually an alchemical recipe, mm-hmm. and that that really triggered my interest in in in, yeah, in, all, in, in the non science bit of Newton, if you like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it turned out to be a bit more than that. Because certainly we both come from these physics backgrounds, and I guess. In those backgrounds, Newton is presented to you as sort of a piece of science. Mm. As in, this is Newtonian mechanics. Here are the formula. Here are some examples. Yes. And yeah. yet, in a way, we sort of learn about it on a par with things like electromagnetism and Coulomb's law and special relativity and stuff that was discovered much later. But I think part of what your work is about is bringing that context home to get a greater understanding of how Newton thought and how physicists thought at the birth of what was called physics, which wasn't necessarily known to be absolutely, physics. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, when, when you're trained as a physicist, you, you, you learn physics. Mm. You don't learn about other physicists mm. or natural philosophers, as they were called in Newton's days, which, which I suppose is, an, is simply not part of the curriculum for good reason, because otherwise you, you would have to take another... <laughs> History, <laughs> religion, everything. Actually, at the same time, it is fascinating, and there are plenty of lessons to be learned from, from history, even from modern physics, if you like. Um, just the context in which particular theories developed informs us about how people perceived those theories in the back in the days, what they, what they meant to, 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 to tell you with those theories. Mm. And it, it teaches us how people perceive the world throughout the ages. Mm. And especially in a day like, in, in, in an age like this, where, for instance, the sciences and humanities are so clearly separated, mm-hmm. um, we, we encounter problems now that, that involve uh, specialists from both sides joining hands, mm. uh, for instance, in medical ethics or something. Mm. So it, it, I think it's, 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 it's a paramount important to understand um, 
how the various disciplines were shaped. Mm-hmm. And Newton's era, Newton, Newton's era is a very important one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I certainly get the sense from reading people write about Newton that he came from an era when physics wasn't discreetly split into lots of different subjects. And in fact, it was all a pursuit of truth. Um, and truth came from philosophers. There's that famous quote about Plato is my friend, Aristotle is my friend, but my greatest friend is the truth that I think yes. came up on our show before. Um, so before your DPhil, you worked on the Newton Project, which I urge everyone to go and seek out. If you go to www.newtonproject.ox.ac.uk, uh, you can find all of the writings of the Newton Project there. And it's essentially an attempt to transcribe and make available for free everything that Isaac Newton ever wrote. So sometimes when I think about how the historians of the future will look back on our era, I pity the mess that they'll be left with. Because if you're trying to write a history of Rome, say in the era of Cicero and Caesar and so on, there's really only a handful of reputable sources that you have to read and balance to construct your account. You don't have 17 different perspectives on everything. But historians of the future will have everything that we're producing, all the millions of documents, paper trails, images, video, audio, emails, text messages, social media... At the same time, when you're attempting to dig through every trace that's left by an individual, especially one as prolific as Isaac Newton, it's interesting to see if it delivers new insights or not, or you find out lots of different uh, bits that don't necessarily change your understanding, if that makes sense, but um, Mm -hmm. are kind of interesting background. So I'm thinking about back in our college, they had the complete letters of T.S. Eliot that was at least 50% of him cancelling dentist appointments due to having a cold rather than magisterial (laughs) poetry. Um, But at the same time, one of the documents that fascinated me from Newton the most when I did my little research for the show was these early notebooks that he wrote as a teenager and his studies of universities, some Mm -hmm. questions on natural philosophy and that kind of thing. Almost a private look at his curiosity on a diverse array of topics. So in the course of going through all these works of Isaac Newton, what kind of new insights did you find in the process of going through and transcribing some of the less well-known works? And what do you think he was working on that few people know about and should know about? One, one, one very curious fact about Newton was that Newton never believed that he had actually discovered anything new. Um, he, he, he was a firm, firm, firm adherer to, to what we now call the Prisca Sapientiae or Prisca Scientiae or an ancient philosophy, if you like. And basically he believed that God had revealed everything there is to know uh, to Adam Adam then transmitted that knowledge to his, his progeny, then, then the flood happened. We are, we are still living in a period when the Bible is, is the biblical history is taken completely literary and, and there's, there's, no, there's not really any doubt about whether events like creation uh, or the flood happened, that there was simple fact for, for someone like Newton. Adam and Eve had existed. Um, the same with Noah after the flood, because after the flood there's just Noah, his wife, and their three children and their wives, there's eight people left on earth, and they then start repopulating it. Um, so Noah still had a vestige of, the, of that knowledge. Um, subsequently, uh, Noah's progeny started losing track and sight of the, of the one true God, and the various nations into which they, their offspring sort of, sort of developed, uh, they started worshipping the stars, their ancestors, so Saturn was Noah in, in Newton's idea and in the ideas of many who studied uh, ancient history. But more, more, more importantly, in some of the ancient religious rites, and particularly those of the Egyptians, um, Newton saw traces of their understanding of heliocentrism, mm. universal gravity, and even, believe it or not, the inverse square law of gravity. Newton never thought that this was his invention. Mm-hmm. It was all there, covered under, under, under a veil of, 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 of ignorance and idolatry, because that was what Star Warship essentially was. And, and so men had lost track of that. And Newton saw it as one of his prime, prime goals in life to uncover what had been lost through man's idolatry. Well, this is fascinating, because I think that we have a view now of science as being incredibly empirical. Scientists, they go through and they observe phenomena that happen in nature, and the only way that you can imagine finding out about the inverse square law of gravity is doing something like what Kepler and Tycho Brahe did, where they observed the motions of the stars and heavens and tried to figure out mathematically how they might have worked. And then they said, aha, this all makes sense if you have an inverse square law of gravity. But you're saying that instead of this approach to science as something empirical, Newton's approach to science was far more 
uncovering lost knowledge that had been sort of imperfectly transmitted from a divine source. I think it was. I think it was both actually, mm -hmm. because New, at the same time Newton was and is this, this empirical scientist mm -hmm. who collects data from all over the world. To for, for his Principia, for instance, from from wherever he can get hold of, you know, uh, the, the heights of of the, of the tides in in, in in Buenos Aires or, yeah. or whatever, uh, Stavanger, and 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 he collects all this information to to basically verify the theories he derived um, deductively, mm -hmm. but and he also believed that it was it was his 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 task. To do so, divinely appointed task, if you like, to 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 study nature to the best of his abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you just discussed the Newton project, um, and one one thing we, we also realized from the very beginning does of all the of all the manuscripts that Newton left, and and they they total at least ten million words, and, and he keeps on keeps on surprising us by by all these tiny scribbles that add up <laughs> to the total. And if you like, originally we thought it was just. Two and a half million words, but it's more than ten actually. Half of those are religious, mm -hmm. are related, especially to the prophecies in Scripture, because that was another source of knowledge. Mm -hmm. You could probe nature um, with your mind and, and with, with, with your senses, but you also had a sacred duty to study Scripture and, and interpret the prophecies therein that had to deal with the past, the present, and the future. Um, as Newton put it somewhere, um, the Jews failed. To recognize Christ for whom he was, because they didn't study their prophecies diligently. So we, as Christians today, uh, should, 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 should be should be should, we should be um, warned in a sense by this uh, not to make the same mistake and, mm -hmm. and fail to recognize Christ at a second coming. Mm -hmm. See, it's it's very interesting because, of course, it, it's one of these things that perhaps in the religions of our time, which on the whole are somewhat more secular and a little more willing to say things like, okay, this part of the Bible is metaphorical and this part is open to interpretation and willing to uh, move away from biblical absolutism. We don't see things in the same way, but of course, if you believe that every word in the Bible is directly written by God or divinely inspired in some sense or another, then it becomes your, your go-to point for searching for truth. And I think we'll come on a little bit later mm -hmm. into some of the writings that uh, Newton wrote, uh, specifically looking at the text of the Bible for uh, clues, things that he could interpret for future prophecies. So um, I think just coming back to Newton as a physicist briefly, mm -hmm. one of the key problems we have in explaining his contribution to physics is that we almost take a lot of his work for granted because it forms the foundation that everything else mm. comes from. So the laws of physics, as we know them and we learned them, are expressed in calculus, which was a Newtonian and Leibnizian <laughs> get onto that, invention. Um, and we view even something like quantum mechanics, where you have particles that act like waves and particles at the same time. You have wave-particle duality. But both of these... Uh, lenses for looking at a quantum particle, the wave-like motion and the particle-like motion, again, goes back to the work of Newton. So everything is built on this foundation, and many aspects of later physics have Newtonian approximations or limits that work rather well. It may be that general relativity is the correct or the most correct that we have at the moment uh, theory for gravity, but you can get to the moon just using Newton's laws and Newtonian yeah. gravity. You don't need the uh, little corrections. So to understand this contribution, I think it's important to understand where physics and natural philosophy, as it was, was before Newton, how much he represented a, a paradigm shift and how much he was building on what had been done previously. So where do you think he was a revolutionary uh, and you know, was doing things that hadn't been uh, reached before? No, that, that is actually a very good question because the 17th century is, is under close scrutiny by historians of science to, to, to pinpoint to sort of pivotal moments. Um, we, we, it used to be called the scientific revolution, it's still, it's still a commonly accepted term, but it's not a revolution that, that happened overnight or, or, or within a decade. Um, you could basically say that Francis Bacon at, at the start of the 17th century was the first to, to come up with a fully full-blown empirical sort of program. Um, instead of following the, the, the scholastic tradition, which basically said this is what Aristotle wrote 
so it must be right. <laughs> um, you you were you were you were sort of sort of um, invited to use your own reasoning and and your own your own senses to to probe nature and to to look for regularities and everything. And 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 one 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 reason for this for this shift um, might be uh, Protestantism actually. Which 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 split off from 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 Catholicism about a century before Bacon, if you like, and which has this very inquisitive um, mindset. First of all, towards scriptures, you you are supposed to read the Bible yourself instead of listening to 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 a sermon delivered by a, a, lit, a literally sort of a remote uh, preacher. Um, and, and secondly, because it 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 emphasised the two books, the Book of Nature and the Book of Scriptures. So both were equally important because both contained God's revealed truth. Mm -hmm. So there was an incentive to study nature as well as scripture, um, as, as exemplified by Newton, of course. Now, and then throughout the 17th century, you see people doing interesting things. Galileo is the first to, to pick up a telescope, not create it, but pick it up, and point it at the stars. And then also, and, and then also convincing his contemporaries that what you see through the telescope is actually there. That is not a figment of your of your imagination, as it was often thought. Because I mean, your 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 senses are are troubled. Uh, man isn't isn't perfect because of the fall of man. I mean, we we we're sinful beings. We're not perfect. So whatever we see might not be there. And we all know that if, if after um, let, let, let's for instance, you know, say that you had a couple of drinks after handing in your thesis, <laughs> that things look look, look look slightly different, you know. Um, and and then that's the day after through through. Some sort of headache, with which I have no idea what it come from. Um, things also look again different from what they probably are. And to be fair, when you and I would stare at the same object and give a description of it, it's two different descriptions. Mm -hmm. So there is an element of subjectivity. Um, and but what Bacon tried to do with his experimental program is 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 saying, well, if we all record our observations and then compare them, we we can agree to to. We, we can agree on certain things, and we arrive at a more, of a more or less objective description of nature. Now, all of this was qualitative, so it dealt with uh, this. This is very big. This is very small. This. This is nice. This is so. It was describing it in words. Mm -hmm. And and what Galileo starts to do with what Newton, what Descartes, but especially Newton, uh, first um, tries to do is is come up with mathematical descriptions of nature, mm -hmm. and this goes horribly wrong. 1672, Newton is 29, and, and, and he publishes his first scientific paper, if you like, and it's his new theory of light and colors, published in the Transactions, uh, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. It, it's read out um, at their meeting, as was what was, was usual. Um, a whole debate starts, it lasts for a year, and after a year, no one believes that Newton was right. <laughs> Uh, what was the theory that he was proposing? Well, that light consists of, 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 of different rays with different colours, and, and, and that if you put it through a prism, then it would show all these colours, and he could recombine them and everything. Um, basically, our modern theory of, 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 of light. Mm -hmm. um, so he was right, if you like. <laughs> and yet no one accepted what, 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 what he did because of how he did it. Instead of building, you know, taking, taking, taking a basic experiment doing one thing and then taking another experiment that builds upon the next one and the next one, providing a, a sequence of experiments, as his predecessor Robert Boyle had, 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 had shown was the right method. He just gave one experiment. Mm -hmm. He also gave the one experiment in, in a very similar description without a lot of detail, because he felt that philosophers of nature had to do this sort of themselves. The only way to convince yourself of, of, of truth about nature is by, by doing the experiment yourself not by f replicating what someone else has done. So he didn't give all the details, because that was part of doing it yourself, figuring out all the details. Um, but at the same time, you know, that was not accepted practice, nor was the use of a prism for that matter. A prism is now a standard tool, if you like, in, in, in the scientific instrument box. But it was a children's plaything. Mm -hmm. You bought it at a fair. Mm -hmm. And he turns it into a scientific instrument. So all these things combined with his slightly cocky nature, and, and his response to his critics. Basically, uh, within, within a year and a month, he actually writes a letter to the Royal Society saying, well, I, 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 I want to resign. Mm -hmm. I'm so fed up with natural philosophy because it's all it's quarreling. Yes, and no one will believe me. No one will believe me. Ah, <laughs> a, a little bit childish, actually, mm -hmm. which, which, which is probably true. Um, so, so, but he, he first... In the paper, he gives a fairly mathematical description of of of, of light and colours, and that, of course, and then 
he keeps that, that mathematical stance towards, towards nature, culminating in the Principia of 1687, the book that gives him instant fame, which is a purely mathematical description of nature, which is very much um, a break with what Descartes and the people before him did, because he gives a mathematical description of nature. He does not give a, a, a full-blown description of everything in nature, including primary causes. Mm -hmm. So his system is not closed. Yes. For instance, nowhere in the Principia will you find anything about the cause of gravity, uh, basically because he, he, he didn't manage to find it. Mm. Phenomenologically described. Exactly. What you also don't find in the Principia, by the way, is calculus. Mm. Nor in any of the drafts. Yes, this is one of the things that I learned when I foolishly said that I had read the Principia and then realised I'd actually have to read it when I was applying to this play. And I realised that, of course, back then everything was expressed in this very geometrical um, ter terms. Uh, things weren't done with calculus at all. And in fact, geometry... I, I get the sense that amongst mathematicians, calculus was seen as this newfangled thing that they weren't necessarily inclined to trust. Whereas geometry goes all the way back to the Greeks and Pythagoras, and Absolutely. they were smarter than us, and they had it right. Well, so it, it is actually it's very true indeed, and it's probably the reason why Newton wrote the Principia using geometry, highly advanced geometry, I have to say, and he actually invents more sophisticated geometry to to come up with all the corollaries and everything. So as a mathematical primer if you on, on geometry it's, it's wonderful mm -hmm. because he also explains it rather well but at the same time there is this question why develop calculus 20 years before the principia and then not use it not mm -hmm. even in your in your your draft calculation it, for, for, for a long time there was this idea oh, we, we will find the drafts and they will show calculus and then he, he probably recast it in 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 in, 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 in geometry just for the mm -hmm. sake of uh sort of Getting it accepted. Yes. Learning from his previous mistake, if you mm. like. From from the optics debacle where he relied on a prism experiment that no one else seemed to agree with. So when it comes to Newton the radical, I guess part of that is um, not only this unorthodoxy uh, in terms of the experiments that he set up, but also unorthodoxy in terms of the mathematics that he had co-invented or simultaneously invented and was using. Um, I think it's very interesting too that one sense that we've got here is this the fact that it comes out of this cultural uh, change in Protestantism where people are encouraged to read the Bible and of course historically we have all kinds of interesting things going on at this time when people first start reading the Bible like some of them decide for example there's the Anabaptists in Munster and so on who become strange almost um, cult-like I guess mm -hmm. uh, with their new interpretations of the Bible um, but so, so you go through this it's interesting we go from uh, Absolute truths are handed down to us by the priest or by the Greeks. And then we go through a sort of know your own subjective observations and experiment and your own subjective observations of the world are to be valued. And then we sort of come back to a universalism in the mathematical description of this. Like your observations, your experiments. And this is, of course, a very important principle in physics that allows us to infer uh, things about the stars and distant corners of galaxies and so on. It's the idea that the laws of physics apply everywhere, yeah. and they are universal, in the same way that I guess a conception of a god is also universal yes, and pervades yes. all of space and time. And you know, this is an assumption, a very, very good and well-tested assumption, but an assumption nonetheless that uh, underpins our understanding of modern physics, that this mathematical description of the laws are universal, and you can do an experiment on a desktop in the Cavendish Laboratory in Oxford that you could repeat under the same conditions on Mars or in Buenos Aires or wherever you like. Um, so your speciality, I think, and the topic of your thesis is uh, is on Isaac Newton's chronological studies. Indeed, yes. Um, so this is something that I mentioned in the podcast as part of the perhaps less famous side of Isaac Newton's work, alongside things like alchemy and this forecasting in the Bible that we talked about. So could you explain to the audience, first of all, what these type of chronological studies are trying to achieve? and what Newton personally was trying to achieve with his take on the topics. What do they teach us about Newton? In order to, to, to understand what Newton was up to and what people in his time were up to, we have to, we have to go back to the Renaissance. So Renaissance is this, this, this blossoming period which, which happens in Italy, uh, in the Low Countries, and nowhere else in the world, for some mm. odd reason, uh, of a rediscovery of, of, of ancient texts. And these include texts in, 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 in Greek and in Arab, 
that have been transmitted um, via via well, Byzantium, the, the the remnants of the remains of the East uh, the East Roman Empire, uh, through through the, the the Ottoman cultures and 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 through the Islamic cultures, and and these are preserved texts by Aristotle and Plato, which had arrived about a century before that, but also texts by ancient historians, and and, and two notable names here are Barossus or Barossus the Chaldean. Um, an ancient uh, Assyrian uh, astronomer and historian who probably lived about, if, if he existed, lived in about uh, the 5th century BCE, and, and Manito, uh, Manito, an, an Egyptian priest uh, mentioned by Herodotus, um, who, 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 who came up with, with, with a whole list of dynasties, of, of Egyptian dynasties, um, that stretch back for, for thousands and thousands of years. And so did Barossus with his list of, of, of Assyrian history. Um, again, thousands and thousands of years back in time. Now, that was a problem <laughs> if you believe that creation happened in about 4004 BC, um, BCE. Um, and this is a Protestant idea, isn't it? That you can date creation to 4004 BC, or was it worked out before that? Well, the 4004 BC is James Usher's uh, 1650 uh, calculation. I think he actually said 945. Just, just, just when a.m. Have your, yeah, a.m. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. In the morning, yeah. So, so maybe it's a position that is, the Protestantism there, but but throughout the the throughout through church history and even before that, so Judaic um, historiography, uh, there were calculations on on when about the creation had happened, and mm. they, they 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 varied greatly. Um, but the two most common dates were in about 4000 BCE and in about 5500 BCE, because there was not one. Bible. Mm. The Septuagint translation of the Bible, which is a Greek translation named after the, the, the mythological 70 scribes who, 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 within the span of a week or so, copied the entire Bible from Hebrew into Greek, um, they, in, in their li- lineages of the descendants of Adam, they, in, they, they came up with different, different years for when people like Abraham and, and, and his father, how old they had become and when they generated their first, their first offspring and everything. That all added up to an additional 1,500 years. Mm. So you had, you had a lot of leeway to, 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 to incorporate a, ancient histories from other, from other nations. But even the five and a half thousand years was not enough for Manito's King's List. King's List, by the way, that we still use in Egyptology. That's because, yeah, they are actually quite reliable. Mm. And, and our, our current division into first, second and third um, sort, sort of larger dynasties uh, that, that we have, periods, in, in, derived from Manito. But, so, in, in, in the Renaissance, we're in about... 1460, those texts are then first translated into, in, 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 from Greek into Latin, and, and they, 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 they try to, to, to establish copy texts because they have various Latin ver- various uh, Greek versions of those texts and everything, and they, they try to... So th- this is also philology, which, which, which comes into being as a discipline. And, and throughout the, 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 the 15th, 16th, and early 17th century, the discipline develops, in particular with the works of, uh, of Scaliger, Joseph Justice Scaliger, who, who aligns all the ancient calendars in use, who all make use of different year, so a solar mm. year, a lunar year, a solar lunar year, and what have you. That's uh, a conversion nightmare. A conversion nightmare, but he does it. He does it, and he, he manages to come up with, 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 with dates in each of these cal- calendars for each of the key events in each of those calendars. So he creates a massive table, if you like, where you can basically look up, all right, so the flood in, in Judean um, history happened in in on, in. in Minus 1044 uh, Anno Nabonassar, which is the Babylonian calendar, mm-hmm. which started starts in 70, 741 BCE with uh, King Nabonassar, who was raised and everything, and, and so forth and so forth. And, and, and he, he, he then, with him, the discipline matures, actually. So chronology is all about getting calendars right. Using eclipses, for instance, to, to because those, those, those are such pivotal events that all the, 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 the ancient historians describe them, yes. and so forth, and so forth. Um, what, what happens through the Reformation is that the, the, the new Protestant church it is very eager to establish itself as the one true church. Mm-hmm. So they write their own histories mm-hmm. in which... Um, the Roman Catholics are, of course, evil. Uh, they are the good, the good guys. Mm-hmm. And um, 
they, they, they try to incorporate all these, these, these ancient histories in such a way that they all point at the coming of Christ using the, the, the idea of ancient knowledge, which Newton also believed in, so that, that Plato foresaw Christ's coming and figures like Hermes Trismegistus and Zoroaster and all these mythological figures that had all this knowledge and everything. Um, so chronology also becomes a polemical tool mm -hmm. to be used in, in, in debates. And one very important key concept for, for, for putting all these histories in, into uh, a sort of an accepted format is, is provided by a prophecy from the book of Daniel. And it's the prophecy of the four monarchies. And in Daniel there are basically two different sets of visions, or two different visions that describe the same prophecy. So in Daniel, so Daniel is, is, this, is this Jewish nobleman who, who's taken into exile by, by, by a first general and later king Nebuchadnezzar in about 600 uh, BCE. And he's at the court and, and he, he, he gets, well, he, he's, he's treated very well actually, he's a clever guy as well. And, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar is, 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 is tormented by, by, by dreams, that, that he, inexplicable dreams. Um, at the same time, uh, writing on a wall at one point. Oh no, that's that's another that's another one. That's, that's another one. Okay. Yeah, that's another one. The men and men are taken off scene. This is just before the the, the 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 Persian Empire is overthrown by the Median Empire. I see. I see. Yeah, but we are we are we are, we are several kings before before <laughs> before okay. the, the Belshazzar and the king. Um, so we're in about six hundred. Um, and and Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, but he he refuses actually to tell his 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 magicians about the dream, or he refused to tell them the actual dream. If they are as good as they are, they say they, say they are, then they should know about the dream already. <laughs> oh yeah, so, so he basically started to, kill, to, to, to slaughter them all, and, and, and they then draw, they then grab this, this Jewish guy, well, you're clever, you have a different God from we, so maybe you can do it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, Daniel then, then, then from God receives the dream uh, and, and, and the explanation. And the dream is about a statue, a massive statue um, with, with a golden head, s silver torso, bronze legs, uh, and iron and clay feet. Mm -hmm. And according to, to, to Daniel, those, those then represent four different monarchies. The, the, the golden monarchy is, 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 is basically the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, which, which is formed by, by the Assyrians and at some point um, then sort of becomes divided by the Persians and the Medes as the silver. Uh, then, then, then another empire comes and then the final empire is then actually being overthrown by a stone rolling off a hill, a very small stone, that, that generates such... such momentous momentum that, that it throws a, that it basically breaks the entire statue into pieces and this is then prophesied as the coming of the messiah the jewish messiah mm -hmm. who, will, who will who will smite the world and establish his reign for once and, and for all now this is then complemented by a second series of visions in the sixth chapter of of of, of daniel where he sees he's in a dream state um, and he sees four four animals and and each of those animals then again represents um one of the four monarchies that we just had, but this time much more more clearer. So the second animal, for instance, is a um, is a bear which holds in its mouth um, a piece of a piece of meat which clearly has three ribs in it. So so Daniel's oral. So so the second the second monarchy then is actually a three fourth monarchy. The, the third monarchy is a leopard with wings. So it's a swift empire which which, which historians later then described, oh, this must be uh, the, the empire of Alexander the Great, which mm -hmm. was swift and conquered the world. And the fourth one is a brutal beast with jaws of steel that tremples the entire world. They have the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So, of course, a theologian would later then say then that, that the whole book was, was only composed during the, 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 the period of the Roman Empire, so retrospectively applying all this to what had happened in the past. But anyway, um, as... as um, the, the, the Fourth Empire, the Roman Empire, did not end with the fall of, um, of Rome, or for that matter, with the fall of Constantinople and Byzantium, because in 800, um, then Emperor, um, and now my, his name escapes me. Charlemagne? Yes, thank you. Of course, Charlemagne. Charlemagne yes, becomes the Holy Roman Empire. Exactly. And so with the Holy Roman Empire, through the concept of what's called Translatio Imperii, the, the Roman Empire sort of, sort of, sort of continues... And it's still there, of course, during the Reformation period mm -hmm. and afterwards. So, so sorry, let me try and get this right. So, you have these prophecies about the four empires. Yes. And there is a belief that after the fourth empire, which the historians and chronologists of the time have identified as the Roman Empire, after that falls, then you have 
the second coming of the Messiah yes. or the first arrival of the Messiah? No, that's a good question. That is, that is like a, a debate, because from what you were saying earlier, people were arguing about whether the Jews misinterpreted their own prophecies, mm-hmm. which would be this prophecy of Daniel that there has to be four empires and then a Messiah. And from another altern- from an alternative perspective, I guess you could say, after the Roman Empire finally falls, then you have the second coming of the Messiah and this sort of uh, thousand-year millennialist prophecy that is yes. starting to become... Uh, more popular, I guess, in the Reformation era, this idea that the second coming is imminent. Absolutely. You can basically see a a wave-particle duality here. (laughs) One thing about Jewish prophecy, Jewish philosophy, Jewish history is that it's not black and white. It's never either or. Mm -hmm. There's always multiple interpretation of the same prophecy, and they're all right. Mm -hmm. There's a reason, for instance, why there's also two creation stories in the book of Genesis. And they're both right. Yes, in Genesis 2, verses 3 or something, the whole thing starts over again. In the first creation story, you have just you have you have Adam and Eve being being created at the same time and being given the, the guardianship over over the entire world. Mm-hmm. And in the second one, it's a story of Adam who's so so lonely and, and desires a, a companion, and then God creates Eve from his rib. They are two concurrent. They're two competing stories. They don't match. Don't but it's know. not it's not a problem for a no. Jewish historian or a, or or a religious Jew whatsoever because it's not black and white. It's not either or. There are multiple versions of the truth, and they're all correct at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome to quantum mechanics, <laughs> BCE, if yeah, you like. Yeah, exactly. Ancient Judaism stuff. But to, fa- to fast forward this whole to to to, to Newton, because mm-hmm. I can go on. I mean, I've I've, I've studied this for, for the past five years, basically. No, of course, no, it's fascinating. Uh, so, 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 New, 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 Newton takes this to to its extremes. With Newton, he said, N- Newton firmly believes that not only the fourth animal has survived, the fourth empire has survived, but he claims that the previous three empires are also still there, present in their successor states. Okay. So, in, we're in the 17th century, um, the kingdom of Persia is still there, if you like. It's not mm-hmm. a kingdom, it's a vassal state of the Islamic empire, but geographically speaking, it's still there. Mm-hmm. And Newton comes to his interpretation by simply saying, well, if both, if both of these of these prophecies, if you like, or visions, so the statue and the four animals, if both of them are about the same events happening with the statue, you clearly see that the, the entire statue is there, all four empires are there, one, when all the all stone the hits, and they're all conquered at the same time, that means they have to be there when Christ returns, in one way or the other. And he then starts mapping elements of the prophecies as found in Daniel onto the prophecies as found in the last book of the Bible, the Revelation of Saint mm-hmm. John, or you call the Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he starts, all right. So where do these where do these empires return? And he has various ideas about it. And we go into way too much detail now, but we have actually now reached the heart of why Newton studied ancient histories and ancient civilizations. He is not interested in doing something like Scardica did, creating a world line and everything, just for sort of academics' sort of mm-hmm. sake. No, he, he wants to understand the prophecies, because it's a sacred duty of everyone, including himself, to understand these prophecies. And he takes this utterly, utterly serious. Of course. And he thinks, he thinks that, the, that the whole search for gravity and, 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 and all this physics stuff it's quite nice, <laughs> but absolutely unimportant compared to understanding where mankind is on God's great timeline. Mm-hmm. Now, in order to understand these prophecies correctly, you need to have a timeline in the first place, and it needs to be an unambiguous timeline. Mm-hmm. So he sticks with the Masoretic interpretation of Scripture, which, which is the one that, that, that says creation in about 4004 BC, so without all the, without all the emendations in the text. Uh, but at the same time, he is not... A biblical literalist. And this is very interesting. This is very often misunderstood. Newton is very orthodox in his biblical inter- in his Bible interpretation. But he also says, well, the prophecies in Scripture, the books of the prophets, those are very reliable, even when it comes to historical facts, because they have received their information directly from God. That's why mm-hmm. they're prophets. Whereas, for instance, the chronologists who write down the chronicles of, 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 of Israel, or the books of Kings and the books of Samuel, the, the, let's say, the historical books, they very often, very often they were written years and years after the events had actually happened, or even centuries after the events happened. And they actually mentioned the fact that they used other books no longer extant. Yes, that's right. There's lots of this. Um, and I suppose this is something that also comes when 
Protestantism arises, that people start to look into the source of the Bible, yes. which presumably was yes. before obscured, and um, I suppose there was no way in which you could question this. But we know there's things like Apocrypha and books of yeah. the Bible that were once considered part of the Bible and then were decided not to be, and common sources that various different people copied from absolutely, that we no longer have access to. But that, yeah, so, so literary criticism, as we, as we now have it, or biblical criticism, has its heydays in the 19th century, mm-hmm. but it emerges, in, in, it slowly emerges in Newton's, Newton's time. Um, Jean Leclerc is a remonstrant preacher from, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, um, of Huguenot stock, who, who is one of the first, together with, with the Frenchman Richard Simon, to, 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 to look at the Bible from a literary perspective, and they are, of course, branded as heretics straight away. <laughs> But what they did was not that shocking, basically. They simply tried to understand things like, well, if Moses' death is mentioned at the end of the book of, of the Exodus, I think, or, or is mentioned in the Pentateuch in the first five books of the Bible, then Moses cannot have been the author of those five books, mm-hmm. or at least not of that little bit that describes his death and so forth. But that was seen as, as, as fairly heretic, fairly, ooh, tricky. Mm-hmm. You couldn't say that. Um, what does Newton basically says? Well, we have the text of the Bible, and uh, I'm happy with the prophecies, but the, the historical stuff, yeah, I don't want. I believe it in, in sort of in general, but I ha- but but it's 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 written by by uninformed people, if you like. It's been corrupted by humans, and bits have been added, exactly. and so on. Exactly. Exactly. And 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 he, he basically, I mean, but it's a development in his own thought. Mm-hmm. So when Newton first starts trying to create a timeline of the kings who reigned over Babylon just before Nebuchadnezzar and then all the way down to about 338 when Alexander the Great conquers the the Persian Empire Mm -hmm. um, slaying one Darius in the meantime um, he tries to understand I mean he he, he tries to come up with with, with a whole timeline and and, and to, 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 to match the various Dariuses and Artaxerxeses and Asveruses and Xerxeses. It doesn't help when everyone has the same they name. They all have the same name, also because, well, those are like, most of them are actually titles, not names, but mm-hmm. philology was still in its infancy, despite all the efforts of, of the Renaissance scholars and, and of Scalia and everything. So, I mean, today you, just, you do a Google search or whatever, mm-hmm. Google Translate, but they didn't have those things. They had to figure it out themselves. They couldn't read hieroglyphics. And, and so they had to figure out, they, had, they came up with all sorts of weird ex- interpretations of those symbols and everything but anyway so Newton first first sort of consults Jewish historians Mm -hmm. that 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 that, that wrote histories based on the Bible including the Roman uh, Jewish uh, historian Flavius Josephus very important well well, basically what they did they will simply say well we only accept those kings mentioned in in the biblical records and if they, if one is called Darius here and another one is called Darius there, then it must be the same because mm-hmm. there's only one king Darius. So they're, they're, they make the, the silliest of mistakes. He realizes, and he then sort of moves on. And at some point, considering the fact whether there might actually, so so there's two biblical books called Ezra and Nehemiah that describe the events just after the the the, the, the Babylonian exile. And at some point, Newton considers whether there might have actually been two Ezra's and two Nehemiah's in order to, to, to get a timeline that makes sense. And then mm-hmm. again, at another stage, he said, now it must be the same Ezra and the same Nehemiah following the rules of, 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 of Regulandi that, that he actually lists in the Principia. Mm-hmm. So the simplest of expl- explanations often, often should have preference. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And by applying that, he finally sort of manages to convince himself that it might actually be a better idea to start writing this bit of history from the Roman and, and Greek perspective, mm-hmm. because their historians have have a very good grasp of of what happened uh, throughout the period of about six hundred to four hundred BCE, mm-hmm. um, despite the fact that they were not really in the region. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he uses this to calibrate scripture. And this is brilliant. He starts cutting and pasting the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This goes here, this goes here, this goes here. All based on the, the Greek copy of Ezra that is found in the book of Esdras, which is uh, seen as one of the, uh, the apocryphals, but he, you know, he, now sees for what, he now sees it for what it is, a Greek translation of Ezra, which has various events in a different order from the book of Ezra, 
But seeing as it's a later copy, it might actually be more, 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 more closer to the truth, if you like. Um, and then there's the book of Daniel, which has historical bits and prophetical bits, but it's all done by Daniel, who is a prophet and thus is reliable. Mm-hmm. I see. And, and that is basically what he thinks is the most important thing you, you, you can do in your life, figuring all this out, then trying to interpret how it works with the various events prophesied in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, and trying to understand where you are. And, and there was good reason. I mean, think of it. The man grows up in, 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 in Lincolnshire in 1642. Within a couple of years, I mean, without a father, by the way, born on Christmas Day, to, to add to all the mythology <laughs> here. Um, within a couple of years, the Civil War breaks, 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 breaks on his doorstep, basically. Mm. By that time, his mother has basically left him to live with, with, a, with a vicar, with whom she gets three children, and, and Newton is there with, with his grandparents. Well, yeah, nice. Thank you, Mama. Mm-hmm. So his mother comes back. Uh, incidentally, uh, it came in the middle of the Civil War. Um, young lad goes to Cambridge. Within a couple of years, uh, plague breaks loose. Mm-hmm. Um, he has to leave Cambridge uh, for, for Woolsthorpe, uh, where sitting under the apple tree, yeah, we all know. Yes. Um, anyway, um, this comet's in the sky, fiery harbingers of doom. Mm. Um, plague has gone, 1666, ominous year, of course, mm. for its numerical significance. London is on fire. Yes. 80% of the city burns down. But those are Apocalyptic events, if you like. So, then also being raised as a Puritan, where the fifth monarchy, as it was literally called, is never far away, so the return of Christ, who would then establish his, his millennial reign on earth. So, he is, he is, this is his bread and butter, if you like. He's, 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 he's grounded in this. Uh, and, and despite the fact that, that, that he distance, distanciates himself from his, his puritanical, uh, puritan sort of background, becoming an anti-Trinitarian, of course, and so forth, um, some of it still sticks, in particular that, that strong emphasis on, 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 on reading the scriptures and trying to understand the signs of the times. Mm-hmm. Because I think, so people who've listened to this show before will remember that a few episodes back, uh, I interviewed a guy, Phil Torres, who is an American scholar who talks about existential risks, the apocalypse, and the apocalypse from a religious perspective. Ah. And one of the things that he mentioned to me that I had never thought of, because you know I'm a very secular person who doesn't spend much time thinking about these things, but for example, that a lot of the right-wing uh, religious uh, movements and motivations and sentiments in America is in fact associated with interpretations of biblical prophecy yeah. about the kingdom of Israel. Yeah. And the kingdom of Israel must prosper and so on for the second coming to be arisen. Yeah. And it seems like what you're saying to me is that they have a very similar phenomenon that's going on in the 17th century. Absolutely. Where people like Newton and others are coming out of this Protestant Reformation. People are reading the Bible for the first time. Yeah. They're deciding that they can interpret its prophecies. They're deciding that there's an imminence to the return of Christ. And so you have... When we're looking at Newton's chronology, there are sort of two potential motivations that you can see for being focused on this. And one is just to make sure that uh, the if you believe that biblical truth is absolute, then it should all fit together. And so it's applying the laws of logic to that and trying to say, okay, how can we figure out which bits of the Bible are true and which bits are divinely inspired and which bits are less true and so on, so that you can interpret the prophecies correctly. So... On one level, it's about having a chronology that fits together, that makes logical sense, that you can argue about and defend. Um, But then on the second level, there's almost a a, a very political side to this, where people are attempting to get this chronology working so that they can interpret the geopolitical events of the day, Um, the the rise and fall of empires and so on, Mm -hmm. earthly empires being intimately linked to this prophecy, depending on how you interpret the prophecy. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, um, I think it's a very good analysis that you make. Um, I think there are these two elements, but they were always combined in mm-hmm. the 17th century mind. Mm. This, is, this is how we today like, like to, to... We like to, to discretize. We like to com- yeah, discretize, compartmentalize and everything, we, which is all right in a sense, because it helps us understand what's going on. But at the same time, we should never forget that in Newton's days, and for Newton, all these things were connected. Mm-hmm. And, and if, if, you, if I might sort of piggyback uh, on this, um, N- Newton himself has been studied in fairly 
compartmentalized way. So mm-hmm. in the in the in the nineteenth century, when the discipline of history of science sort of kicks off, there is no interest whatsoever in the non scientific bits of Newton. Yeah, it's so, like he did a little bit of physics and all this other stuff: the chronology, the religion, the alchemy. We don't care about. We don't care about basically no. So so, so Newton's eighteen fifty five biographer uh, David Brewster, he, he devoted still a couple of chapters to Newton's religious life and studied everything, basically trying to defend him from 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 anti from from sort of. The, 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 the fact that, that he was labelled as an anti-Trinitarian, which everyone believed in those days, apart from David Brewster, apparently. So I suppose you would argue for a more holistic approach to interpreting Newton's life and works? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yeah, uh, and not just Newton, although I will explain a bit about Newton in a second. Um, the whole study of, of, of the 17th century and before, and even the, until the early 19th century, um, we have to make sure that we do not retrospectively apply our... our, our our sort of divisions, our, our disciplines, uh, onto what they were doing. Those disciplines are 19th century inventions. It's William Ewell in 1833 first coins the term science, <laughs> describing what we would now call science. Whereas in Newton's days, science or scientia was basically every form of, of knowledge <laughs> which could then be, be, be generated via the Bible or via nature. But in, 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 in Newton's um, mind, everything he did was connected, whether he acknowledged it or not. For instance, at some point Newton says that his theology and his uh, natural philosophical methodology have nothing to do with each other because they use different, um, different rules of reasoning. But the only thing you need to do is map his rules of interpreting the prophecies on his rules for reasoning uh, in scripture, on his rules for um, the, 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 the rules that he puts in the Principia on, on how to how to how to come how to derive um, valid conclusions from 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 empirical data, they are essentially the same. Mm-hmm. From a philosophy of science point of view, you're staring at three different translations of the same set of, of rules, just applied to different topics, mm-hmm. but they share the same methodological grounding. And, and with Newton's idea of, of, of the, the, the ancient knowledge, the Prisca Scientia, Prisca Sapientia, it, all make, it also makes sense for everything to be connected. And there's one, there's one drawing. So most of Newton's writings are very boring because they don't have pictures. <laughs> My thesis has 31 pictures and one table. So <laughs> but that's one on every 10 pages, basically. And, but, because you can you can tell a story through pictures. Yeah, so yeah. right now I'm, I'm I'm waving my hands, but I know you can't see that. But mm-hmm. there's a diagram in in what, what is otherwise an alchemical manuscript, where Newton is copying from various alchemical sources. And in the diagram, he has Noah and various sons of Noah. He has the various Egyptian gods and Latin gods and Greek gods. He has uh, chemical alchemical elements. He has. Uh, the, the, the sun, moon and stars, the then known planets, the four elements and the fifth element, the quintessentia, equating each of these with each other, if you like. So Noah is Saturn, is the element of lead, I think, is, is so and so and so and so. And there is a dialogue going on between the various stages in which Newton edited the scheme because there's a lot of there's a lot of, of deleting and, and, and adding and everything and there are also two 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 drafts for the for the for the for the same thing. And you can basically see how Newton tries to understand how matter works. So matter as we know it nowadays, what is matter, what does it consist of what does something consist of by reading ancient mythology. Mm-hmm. Because if the Romans associated the goddess Ceres with the earth, and if they associated the goddess Minerva with the sky, but if then in other mythologies the equivalents of those gods are associated with other elements, what does this tell us about, let's say, matter that cannot be easily defined like the quintessence, this might need some explanation. The quintessence, yes. the fifth element, is, 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 is traditionally seen in Newton's days as, as a mysterious element. So we have earth, air, fire, water, Those are the, our yes. Aristotelian the four, four yes. elements, and then there's a fifth mysterious element. a fifth one. element, yes, which is a brilliant movie with Bruce Willis <laughs> and Mila Jovovich, which you should all see. But 
And there's a reason why it's called the fifth element, yeah, yeah. because she, aka love, is the fifth element. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 incredibly difficult to grasp. It's it's because as Newton at some point says, it is earth like and water like, it is air like and, 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 and fire like, it embodies all these qualities, which he realizes from reading up on classical mythology. Mm-hmm. So he uses mythology to define the quintessence, and then you think, now what does this to do with science? This is some sort of science fiction. Well, Newton is still searching for the cause of gravity mm-hmm. when he's writing this, and he's contemplating the following. If, 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 if solid bodies would actually have tiny holes in them, and if inside these holes, the, 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 the gaseous, yet at the same time, so, 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 so gaseous, so, so floating, if you like, yet at the same time, earth-like, Substance called the quintessence, sort of would, would sort of would sort of flow in. It would it would give give heaviness to the objects because of its earth-like qualities. Yet it would be able to get into these holes because of its its gaseous form, mm-hmm. its its air-like quality. So it would basically add gravity to anything. This is such an interesting concept of gravity too, because now in physics, very very recently. We have the all permeating Higgs field mm. generated mm. by the Higgs boson, oh, I which love it. itself, I mean, through through mechanisms that are kind of quite difficult to explain, I guess, it's now believed that the Higgs boson and the Higgs field determine the masses of all the subatomic particles that determine the masses of everything else. And of course, what is mass? Mass is essentially just it tells you how much gravity tugs on you and yeah. how much you resist being pushed and pulled by forces. So, in a, in a strange way, Newton's understanding of a sort of mystical fifth element that permeates all matter and gives it gravitational force is not too far away from what we have to do. <laughs> Isn't it? No. No. And Newton eventually discarded it. <laughs> okay. Well, well, <laughs> <there> we <go. laughs> no Newtonian for, for reasons that, that are slightly complicated. But he... Um, Yes, no. Um, but, you know, the light particle duality existed in Newton's days as well. Yeah, well, th- this is one of the things that we talked about in the shows, is that he was trying to work out whether light was made up of corpuscules or waves, and it was one of the problems that, that I think genuinely frustrated him quite a lot. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and philosophers around him, basically. Mm. Uh, Christian Huygens, the Dutch scientist, would, would say, well, it's all wave fronts, basically. Not, not, not basically we understand them now. Yes. Newton was saying it was particle-like, but he couldn't actually explain why it had to be particles. And so mm. there were these innate ideas and, and convictions, if you like. So, so it has to be that way. But how do we show it? Thanks very much for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. Our guest today was C.J. Schilt, a History of Science DPhil student here at Oxford. In a few weeks' time, I have no doubt, Dr. Schult. If you want to find out more, you can follow him on Twitter, and do visit the blog Corpus Newtonicum. That's www.corpusnewtonicum.wordpress.com. You can also check out the Newton Project at www.newtonproject.ox.ac.uk, which CJ contributed to. It's an attempt to transcribe all of Newton's works. In the meantime, for us, just a few messages. Subscribe to the sister podcast, Autocracy Now, which deals with the history of notorious dictators. We're still going on and on about Stalin because his life was so long and he did so many terrible things to tell you about. You can follow us on Twitter at PhysicsPod. If you visit the website at www.physicspodcast.com, you'll be able to use the contact form to send us any of your comments, questions or concerns. I always like getting people's feedback. You'd also be able to donate to the show if you wish or purchase some of the bonus episodes I've created for the low, low price of $3 using the PayPal link. But of course, the best thing you can do to support the show is always to tell as many of your friends, enemies, people you've vaguely met, anyone who listens to podcasts, people who don't, anyone about the show. The listeners make it all worthwhile. Until next time, take care.